I will teach something deep tonight. If some of you probably, if you watch my videos, then you probably know these verses. And if not, I hope you will enjoy a treat tonight. Job chapter 26, and we will read verse 7. Job chapter 26. We will read verse 7. I will, tonight I will talk about the shape of the universe. Amen. The pyramid shape of the universe. Amen. Amen. Again, amen, the pyramid shape of the universe. Amen. Run the aisle, man. <laughs> Job chapter 26. And we will read verse 7. A lot of us Bible believers may have heard about that and know about that. But we need to establish it with verses, not just uh, say it. So why do we believe that the universe is a pyramid shape? And it might come into mind and explain some things why the Egyptians did pyramids that connected to the universe and to the stars. Why that might be an issue. And you see these pyramid patterns that have to do with elitist globalism and conspiracies too, or with Satanists nowadays. So what is specific about the pyramid shape of the universe that both heaven and hell are interested in? Start from the beginning and then one by one we establish. That's how we come up to this conclusion that the universe is a pyramid shape when we go one by one by one establishing certain points and then it turns into that pyramid. Scripture with scripture. That's what we're known for as Bible believers. Not just one verse and then we go home and that's it. Not just Acts 2.38, you get baptized for salvation, you go home. No, that ain't Bible study. That ain't real Bible study. That is not truth. And unfortunately, people find the truth betting it on one verse and that's it. And if you compare scripture with scripture, to show you the full truth, they think you're crazy. Who's the real serious Bible student? So let's establish this fact with comparing Scripture with Scripture to find this amazing truth. The Bible says in Job chapter 26 and verse 7, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Okay, so then let's assume right here that this will be the earth itself and that the earth, if we go one by one by one, okay, we'll just say that the earth is over here and then it continues on that it stretcheth out the north over the empty place, right? So if it stretches out the north over the empty place, then we have to come to north right here. All right, from this person's point of view who's on the earth, then you stretch it up all the way north over empty place. Hence, we got empty right here. I'm going to have to uh, write the word in a different color. That way it doesn't get confusing. Now, can you all see this color? Sometimes when I use bright colors, people don't see it. Do you see that or no? All right, that's a digat in Korean, all right, for some of you who didn't know. All right, anyway, here's an E. All right, so the empty place. What secular people, scientists, might word it as outer space. What the book of Job would call it, hangeth the earth upon nothing, an empty place. Place. So, if the earth is right here hanging on nothing and then stretching the north over the empty place, we establish north right here. This is all we know so far. Empty and then the earth is hanging on this empty or nothingness. And then you have to go all the way up north. 
OK. One by one, we establish clues. Let's go to another passage. We'll turn to Psalm 75. Psalm 75. Then we'll go to verse 6. Psalm 75. Then we'll go verse 6. Now, who lives up in the north? That's God. God lives up in the north. Look at Psalm 75. It's pretty apparent, and uh, a lot of people don't debate about this. They all know that basically God, he lives up above. We know that God resides in heaven, and God living in heaven itself, it would be on the north. So that should be pretty apparent to us. So let's go to Psalm 75, and then we'll read verse 6. Notice the wording. Isn't this interesting? For promotion, for promotion, excuse me, cometh neither from the east, all right, nor from the west, nor from the south. Okay, it covers east, west, and south. Which direction is missing? North, right? So God says, but, see, contrasting that God's not in east, west, or south. But God is a judge who putteth down one and setteth up another. Now, you see that right there? That shows that God is in the north then. See, the, if you read the verse again in verse 6, we see that the promotion where God promotes sets up as a judge. It doesn't come from the east. It doesn't come from the west. It doesn't come from the south. That leaves only one direction. That's north. But God is a judge. That's the promotion. He putteth down one, setteth up another. That's the promotion right there. Okay, so we know so far that God is in the north. Who wants to go up in the north? We all know. There's a being that tries to go up north. There are dark beings that strive to go up north. Mankind has always, has always had an infatuation and tried to go up north. So why the infatuation unless God is there? Go to 2 Corinthians 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and then we'll read verse 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and then we'll read Verse 2. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Will do. Thank you so much. We know that God lives in the north, and he lives in heaven. For some of you who already know about that, if that's the case, then notice that the Bible calls this the third Heaven. So we know that God lives in heaven, and then God calls this the third heaven. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Notice how the word of God reads right here. Verse 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body. I cannot tell, or whether out of the body. I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. Notice that. And then read verse 4. How that, how that he was caught up into paradise. See, heaven, where God is, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So we can see right here that God lives up in heaven, but then this is called third heaven. Wait a minute. So that means there's not just uh, one heaven. So we can't just call up here heaven because this is third heaven. Meaning, drawing, inferring that there must be a number two, a number one. If you're going to call this number three, so we have to find that clue. What is two then? And then what is one? Okay, let's go. We're going to turn to several passages. Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 4, 
And then we'll read verse 19, Deuteronomy chapter 4, and verse 19. Notice that this outer space that mankind talks about where the sun, moon, stars, and everything is located, God actually calls that heaven as well. God also calls this heaven. So we can guess what the second heaven will be. It's going to be this empty place, this outer space, this nothing, where the sun, moon, and the stars are located. Okay, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 4 and... We'll read verse 19. Word of God reads, Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto where? Heaven. But notice what's in heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven should be driven to worship them and serve them. So notice where the sun, moon, and stars are located. That is also called heaven. So we found our second heaven. What's the first heaven? Let's turn to Genesis 27. Genesis 27. The first heaven you're going to easily find out is going to be the sky above us where we get our rain. So notice that the first heaven is going to be the sky, the atmosphere. Okay, let's go to the book of Genesis. And notice one of the Old Testament saints, he described this place when he gave the blessing. Genesis chapter 27, and we'll read verse 39. It reads, And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, and the dew, that's where you get your rain, your humidity of what? heaven from above. So we found our first heaven, the atmosphere. Go to Amos chapter 9. Amos chapter 9. So notice right here we've discovered our three heavens. And how you discover your three heavens is just simply going through scripture with scripture with scripture. So you found your clue. Go to Amos chapter 9. Amos chapter 9. And then we're going to look at verse 6, verse 6. Now notice from the Word of God that the heaven has stories, like a building or a location or a place will have stories, different levels. So the Bible admits that heaven itself is going to have its own stories. That's why the Bible says third heaven at the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And then we found the other two stories and floors in heaven. And that's referring to the atmosphere, first heaven. And then outer space for the second heaven. Go to Amos chapter 9. Notice at verse 6. It says stories. Did you notice that? Look at that verse. It says stories. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven. Plain as day. So there are three floors in this heaven out here. Okay, now let's establish this a little bit more. We're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. One by one, then the pieces come into place, and then you get the full picture. So we know that there are three levels. Let me write a little bit more right here. That way we can catch up. Second heaven right here. And then we got, if we put this as the ground, then I'm going to put this as first. That way it can be a little bit more visible. Yeah, this one's not working. I'm going to use a different one. <laughs> okay. Okay. So first right here, and then we're going to put a little bit of an atmospheric thing. Okay. First, second, and then third. 
where this red line is. So it has three stories. Let's continue on. Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll read verse 23. The Bible reads, Which is his body? In verse 23, which is his body? That's the body of Christ. The fullness of him that filleth what? All in all. So notice that the body of Christ fills up everything of all of his creation. If it fills up everything in all his cre creation... Notice more specifically, it fills up heaven and earth itself, the entire universe. Go to Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. You might say, you're turning to so many scriptures. Yeah, that's what I'm here for, is to give you so much scripture, because that's what you came here for. If you didn't, you came to the wrong Bible study. All right? Bible study is Bible study. It is not some dudes with long hair, with skinny jeans, and then playing electric guitar music for you, and then we share our feelings in a circle, all right? That's not Bible study. Bible study is you take this out, and you hear pages turning. Not click, 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 like, subscribe, share, ding. Real Bible believers. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 23. And we'll read verse 24. More specifically, the body of Christ fills up heaven and earth itself, which is the universe. The Bible says, Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Verse 24 continues, Saith the Lord, do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. Remember, the body of Christ fills everything, right? Jeremiah 23 says specifically, it fills up the entire universe. Okay, so we can see right here when we look at this picture, then we're going to have to label this as the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Now isn't that something? Your God inhabits, he can be everywhere. That's why he's known as omnipresent. Why is he omnipresent? Because he can be anywhere. God can fill up everything. This is just, uh, it's like a, we are truly a speck of dust, and people think that they can hide from God. You can hide your feelings from God. How can you do that? You have a God that inhabits everything of all of creation. It's insane. Okay, Let's go to several other passages, and then we can see a little bit more about this pyramid shape. Hebrews 12. Now we get to the pyramid shape here. We got some of the introductory pieces in. Now we're going to see it shape a bit. It's going to shape a bit more and more. Okay. Okay. So I got pretty much every continent right here, and you can guess this is Australia, you know, right here, all right? That's, wh that's where you're at, all right? I didn't want you to feel left out. <laughs> okay, let's go, all right. Hebrews chapter 12, and we'll read verse 22. The Bible reads, Notice the heavenly city of God is Mount Zion. So where God lives, right up there, the heavenly city, it's Mount Zion. Hebrews chapter 12, and then we'll read verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Hebrews 12, 22 shows God, where he resides, way on top, is Mount Zion. Now notice this Mount Zion, listen up, this is the important part, Mount Zion. Zion is on the sides, okay? It's not just on the north itself. It's on the sides of the north. Finally, there's some kind of shape here. It cannot be a shape unless it has sides, right? A shape always has sides. Do you remember your geometry? Okay. Okay. I hope you remember that, all right? You cannot have a shape unless it has sides. So go to the book of Psalm. Go 
Go to Psalm 48. Psalm 48. And we'll read verse 2, Psalm 48, and then go to Isaiah 14, Psalm 48, and Isaiah 14. There are two passages you're going to turn to, Psalm 48 and Isaiah 14. Let's draw a bit more now. So here's Mount Zion. Where God resides. And this Mount Zion is known to be on the sides of the north. So we put the sides right here. So let me make this thicker because I know that there's just a lot of drawing here, so it can be confusing. So let me make this part even thicker, darker. Okay, side. Beginning with the psalmist, verse 2, verse 2. Beautiful for, for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. Told you so. All right, go to the next passage. Isaiah 14, 13. Even Satan knew about this place. He wants to go there. Verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. That's Mount Zion, right? In the what? Sides of the north. Okay. We kind of got a clue then. So then the first clue, if a mountain shape, a mountain shape is usually a triangle, right? If a mountain shape is on the sides of of the north, then could be, could be, we can see that the rest of the shape would naturally go like this then. See that? So then, it could be that the rest of the shape, if this mountain shape, this triangle shape, is in the top, it would be logical and reasonable to think that the rest of the shape below uh, would continue down this slope right here, this shape on the sides. Okay, but this is not how we establish the pyramid. It's one by one pieces, and then you're going to see that this is really so. Okay, now uh, that's not a really good triangle, but you know, what can you do, all right? so. I'm not God. I didn't create the universe, all right? So <laughs> let's look at uh, Colossians 2. Colossians 2. So in this somewhat uh, messy triangle that I drew out, follow along with me, and then you're going to see the pieces of the puzzle showing you a beautiful picture, an amazing part of God's creation. Colossians 2, verse 19. Now, common sense, if the body of Christ, if the body of Christ is the universe itself, then let's use our heads. A body is going to have, obviously, a head, correct? Will the body have a head? Yes, the body will have a head. Now, notice what the Bible talks about the head. And then you're going to see this shape a bit more. Go to the book of Colossians 2, 19. The Bible says, and not holding the what? Head, capital. Christ is the head. God is right there on the head of that body. All right, look, uh, hear what I say again, and look at this again. God is right here on the top. Here's the rest of the universe, right? That's what we know so far, right? This is his whole body, right? God is up here. The head, the top, is right here. And then his whole body right here. See that? Okay. Now let's continue, let's continue on. Not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands 
having nourishment ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Look at 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2. God is the head. Notice what the head is known to be. Notice what the head is known to be. 1 Peter chapter 2. The head, Christ is the head of the church, we say, right? Not the Pope, not Peter. Christ is the head of the church. And then the Bible says that this foundation is also known as the chief cornerstone. Ah, and it's known as the head. Okay, look at 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll read verse 7. The Bible reads verse 7. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head, head, right, of the what? Corner. He's the chief cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Look at verse 6. 6 is plain. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Okay. Now, when you're thinking about a cornerstone being the head, see that? A cornerstone being the head of the building. Do you know what uh, people have discovered as they look through all building structures? What is the most perfect cornerstone? to be the head of a building, you know what they all know it to be? The pyramid. Amen. They know that the pyramid itself, that the top of the head is the most perfect shape for the head to be a chief cornerstone. That's what builders have discovered. It's the pyramid itself. That's why the measurements and the perfection of it has baffled many archaeologists and mankind up to this day. No other building shape is more perfect than that, than the pyramid. That's the reason why we can see right here this Mount Zion, see that? Is like that chief cornerstone, the top of the pyramid. That's why you can see how this picture is falling into place more and more. All right. Let me darken the borders a bit more. That way it can become more clear to the eye as you follow along while I teach. All right, but there's more. There's more, okay? And then you're going to see that out of every other shape, the pyramid is the best one. We're going to look at Romans 1. Romans chapter 1. So think about it. Why is it that those sons of God, they started to build their own pyramids down here. You ever thought about that? Why did they build their own pyramids down here and it connected to directly? Pyramids are deliberately built to connect to the universe. Do you realize that? That's what the pyramids were deliberately built for. Why would the sons of God do that? Unless there is something that the universe has to do with the pyramid shape. Another one. Why is it that Luciferians, they, they tr prize, they treasure the pyramid? Why do they all want to infatuate with that? Why do Luciferians want that unless their God, Lucifer, also said, I want to be on the sides of the north sides of the north why is it luciferians when you look at the back of your dollar bill and freemasonry makes a big deal about this and it's all tied to globalists and luciferians why do they put some kind of deity or an all-seeing eye on the very top of the pyramid isn't god all-seeing isn't he everywhere but why would, they put, why would they want to put Lucifer like that? And then to be the top of that pyramid. Very eye-opening. Very eye-opening. A lot of this kind of stuff. 
When you look at satanic symbols nowadays, Luciferian symbols nowadays, you got to realize this. Sometimes when the devil makes some kind of symbol, maybe he's trying to steal God's glory. Because he's always been a thief, the Bible said at John 10. He wants God's glory for himself. Okay, let's look at um, Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Let me, know, let me show you one more pagan shape that's been used to try to steal God's glory. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Notice that Romans 1, 20 talks about that the entirety of God's creation, the universe itself, is an imprint of God. It's an imprint of God. Many creationists have used this to prove that God exists, that things just cannot come out by accident. It's not just from natural workings of evolution. Now, when you look at everything in our creation, it screams out, God exists. It is an imprint of God himself, you have to realize. It is an imprint of God itself. If the universe, so follow me, if the universe itself, all creation itself, is an imprint of not just God, it says Godhead, right? That's the Trinity right there, the Godhead. So if the universe itself has to be an imprint of the Trinity, when people talk to you about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, think about then what shape matches it the best? And some of you have heard about it before. It's triangle. So then you, uh, they talk about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And if you're, the whole universe itself is an imprint of his Godhead. Right. See that? So the best shape that will fit that, or the only shape that you can see that to be, that will fit it, is this triangle shape right here. Which is why you'll notice that pagans, they always use triangles. Some Satanists have used triangles for themselves. Why is that? Why is that? Satan always wants to take God's glory for himself. Let's look at several other passages we're going to look at Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Here are some other factors to consider why the universe shape will be a pyramid itself. Do you know what scientists use to measure and determine the shape of the universe? They use triangles. Didn't you know that? They use triangles to determine the shape of the universe. So science points that out. History points it out. Historians have talked about the pyramids. I mean, out of all shapes, you know, why not a stop sign? Why not an octagon, huh? Why not an igloo, you know? Why not a huge tower, a rectangle? Why is it a pyramid shape right here? Why is it that the Tower of Babel... When, the, when historians and archaeologists have talked about the Tower of Babel or the ziggurats, it's like a triangle shape with the stairs going around like that. Why is it that way? Unless the devil sees that this has to do with the universe itself and trying to reach up to God. That's something to think about. Out of all shapes that I've studied, the pyramid shape is the best. Everything connects the best. Pyramid is the best candidate to point out the shape of the universe. History shows it. Science shows it. Biblical texts support it. And even Luciferian signs as well show it. There's just too much. Uh, even the devil's crowd know that triangle is the best shape when it has to do with the workings of the universe or God. All right. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 4 and verse 2. Verse 2. Now notice that in the top of heaven itself, there is a sea of glass. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven. 
Okay, you see that picture right there? There's a throne set in heaven. But there's a blockage. Notice it says, And one sat on the throne, and he that sat... Uh, let's see, I'm in verse 3 now. We're going to look at verse 3. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting. Okay, let's fast forward a bit. And then notice at verse 6, 6. And before the throne... There was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Okay, notice that in the face of the throne room, we see a sea of glass like pure crystal. All right, so this sea of glass is the one that's blocking. It's the floor of heaven. If this is all solid glass, and that's the floor of heaven itself, then notice that we see a borderline or a stop sign somewhere something that you cannot pass so all of this is the sea of glass you might say why is that why would God God put the sea of glass up there well did you forget what this place is called this place up here is known don't forget is where God resides and it's also called the head. It's the head. It's where God's face is. That's what head means. His face. Okay. Now, I got a question if you read your Bible. Can any human being look at the face of God and live? No. You die. If the universe is his body, and then that top is known to be the head, it would make sense he has to put a block right there. Why? If that block is loose, do you know how the universe will fall into chaos all over? Because no, nothing can stand the face of God and live. So that's why you have to put that sea of glass over there. To block it now I'm going to show you verses later on to prove it I'm going to prove to you later on that as soon as pe as creation itself mankind looks at the face of God that it just it just evaporates it cannot live it cannot survive let's look at some other interesting passages we're going to look at Matthew 27 Matthew chapter 27 and we'll read verse 35, Matthew chapter 27, and we'll read verse 35. Now notice you're not going to get this in a PhD class in science, in astronomy, cosmology, or whatnot. You're not going to learn that. They're not going to teach you that kind of stuff. They don't know. They have no idea. Scientists, when they talk about this huge body of water that's like at the far reaches of outer space, and they're like, this is unheard of. What do you mean unheard of? This was written 2,000 years ago, if not longer than that. The Bible told you about this huge sea out there that's literally at the end of the universe itself. God was way ahead of scientists. Way, way ahead. Let's look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 35. Now notice your King James Bible reads here what Jesus wore. Now, it's not the robe like Hollywood would say that Jesus wore at the crucifixion. We're going to look at Matthew 27, 35. The Bible says, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture, upon my vesture did they cast lots. Jesus' clothes was a garment or vesture. It was not a robe. For some of you who know about a garment or vesture, it's kind of like a poncho that's worn through the top with the head sticking out. Okay, remember that. That's going to be interesting. Look at Hebrews 1. 
Hebrews 1. Now notice why Jesus' body wore a garment or vesture that would just go through the top of his head and the rest would flow out like this in a triangular shaped manner. Isn't that interesting? While Jesus was on earth, he wore it like that. It showed what he was wearing as he's God wearing the clothing of the universe. Look at Hebrews 1, 10 through 12. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they sh all shall wax old as doth a what? Garment and as a what? Vesture. Wait, wait, wait. What did Jesus wear when he was crucified? Garment, vesture. What did the Bible say about the universe? It is like a garment or vesture. Do you remember what the universe is? It's the body of Christ. He's wearing the universe. His body is wearing that universe. What was, why did Jesus wear like that? Because he's used to wearing like that. When he got crucified on the cross, why did he wear a garment or vesture that's like a hole on the top that the head sticks out and then comes down like a poncho in a triangular shape fashion. Why did Jesus dress like that? Because I'm used to wearing like that for all eternity. <laughs> when he created the universe itself, excuse me, when he created the universe itself, at the beginning he says, I'm used to wearing it like that. That's something, right? Man, that's something right there. Jesus was used to wearing like that when he created the universe itself. So when he came down on earth like a man, he was just used to wearing things like that. <laughs> if we keep reading, Verse 12, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Notice that God will one day fold up the universe, his clothing, which is a garment and vesture, and change it someday. Why is that important? It's so important because look at Matthew 27, 35. Go to Matthew 27, 35. The Roman soldiers had no idea what they were doing. Okay, Matthew 27, verse 35. The importance of this is as follows. Long ago, Jesus' garment or vesture was stripped, and man looked at his nakedness and mocked him. They saw his nakedness. They saw his full exposure. And they laughed and mocked at him. Do you realize that God himself, what he was thinking in his mind, how dare you? I could have zapped you to a million pieces. Do you realize what you're laughing at? They have no idea what they're laughing at. Because if, it, if there's no covering to God and he exposed his naked self, do you realize what would happen to this entire creation itself? They had no idea what they were in. Look at it right here. Verse 35. We read that one. Verse 36. And sitting down, they watched him there. Verse 39. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. How about that? But my friend, one day, Jesus' garment, at his first coming, let's go back again, in his first coming, mankind has taken off his garment or vesture saw his naked self and mocked him and laughed. God did that at his first coming, but my friend, at his second coming, when he takes off his garment or vesture, mankind won't be mocking him and laughing at him. And when they see his naked, awesome self, they're going to fall on their knees and cry, Holy, holy, holy. And they will not be bold and mock him. They will fear and weep. Amen. Look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Notice that all the universe and even mankind itself, they run away. They flee. 
Okay, Revelation 21 and then Revelation 20. Revelation 21, Revelation 20. Okay, don't forget Hebrews. Remember Hebrews said this. Sometime in the future, he's going to take off the universe, his clothing, correct? If he takes off his universe and clothing, there go, the whole world will see his naked self, right? Now, do you think that creation can survive like that, that mankind will be able to be upright and bold and be able to live so strongly. No, look at this. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose what? Oh, why? His garment's off. They're going to see his naked self. From whose fate the earth and the heaven still stood? No. The earth and the heaven fled away, and there was what? Found no place for them. I told you so. If you get rid of his covering, and they, you see his naked self, his naked face, this entirety of creation just zaps into nothingness. It's gone. When he comes down that second time at Revelation chapter 20, sets up that great white throne judgment, there is no place to run and hide. And they weep in fear. And Jesus Christ would say to that lost sinner, do you recall when you mocked my only begotten son who died on the cross and you stripped out his garment? You're the one that spat on his face. You're the one that crucified him. And you still laughed and mocked out of him. And I sent you my prophets to warn you about it, to get you out of hell, to get you saved. But you still mocked my son. And every time you saw and heard about the picture of the cross and the preaching of the cross, you just looked at it and thought that you can get away with it. At his second coming, everybody will try to scream, run, and hide, and they cannot. There's found no place for them. Look at Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. Revelation 21, 1. Now remember, Revelation said there was the sea, right? Right here, of glass. Look at Revelation 21, 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was what? No more sea. Oh, this is gone now. Now that this is gone, I'll leave some of that right there in case some of you want to catch that picture at the end, okay? But notice right here, when this is gone, this sea of glass, and what you're looking at, you're looking at the head. You're looking at the face. Face to face. And why do you think Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13... Look at this, 1 Corinthians 13. Why do you think Paul said this? You ever heard of this term? A lot of people didn't know when they read this. 1 Corinthians 13, every church brags about it. It's the best chapter on love, on love, on love. And they miss this out. They miss this out on the chapter on love. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. Why do you think Paul said this? For now we see through a glass darkly, but one day that glass is gone, then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. No wonder Paul said that we see right now, right now when we're going up here, notice this glass that's blocking. We're seeing through that glass darkly. Well, you and I, our knowledge of God is still not very clear 100%. We're seeing him darkly. But then, boom, when this is gone, face to face, we're really going to know God. That's why that song goes, face to face I shall behold here. Face to face, what will it be when with rapture I behold him? G 
Jesus Christ who died for me. Face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry skies. Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by.